Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome this afternoon to our third and final keynote session on community, regional networks, and tobacco harm reduction consumer advocacy. My name is Chem. The keynote is from Nancy Lucas. She is the uh, she's a global tobacco harm reduction advocate who is passionate about consumers having their voices heard in the narrative of tobacco harm reduction and public health policy. She's uh, participated in developing a number of consumer and advocacy groups, including the Coalition of Asia Pacific Tobacco Harm Reduction Advocates. She was also instrumental in the coordination of the SCOP live stream events that ran during the FCTC COP9 uh, in 2021 and on World No Tobacco Day in 2022. After Nancy has concluded her talk, I'll be delighted to ask Amanda, uh, Amanda Wheeler, who is the president of the Rocky Mountain Smoke Free Alliance in Colorado, to share her thoughts. But for now, please welcome Nancy Lucas. Okay, I feel like I'm being interrogated. These lights are really ridiculous. Um, thank you, Chim, and thank you for the GFN organizers for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. And hopefully we all learn something and I don't screw it up because I'm the only keynote being done in person, so you get the live experience with me. Um, can we get the uh, slides up, please? This happened the last time I did this, too. It's me. OK. There you go. My presentation today is about community. It is about how regional advocacy works by having different organizations in one region working together to get to the goal for tobacco harm reduction in policy and regulation and educating people about it as well. Let's see if I screw this up. Yay. OK. We have these organizations. Now, I'm not going to go through each one, but we have organizations in the Philippines. We have an organization in Thailand, which is ASA. We have <laughs> a couple in Indonesia. We have New Zealand, which is AVCA, which is where I got involved in all of this. We have Korea, Hong Kong, Malaysia, and we have Factasia from Hong, um, from Hong Kong, but actually it's in Thailand as well. What did I do? Did I break it? Okay. Oops. CAFA represents and supports all advocates and issues in the wider Asia Pacific region. Now, uh, we do have organizations, but we also support individual consumer advocates. So we're not like, you must be in an organization for us to help you because we understand that what happens in one country impacts another country, and we also remember being solo advocates out there. So when we think of CAFRA, don't think of just the organizations, think of all the advocates, because we're here all to help each other. A country doesn't, yeah, because share, I'm sorry guys, because sharing knowledge is the key to winning this war. Now, when I talk about Asia Pacific, and I think I screwed this up, we know that tobacco harm reduction saves lives. In low and middle income countries, and I'm just gonna put this out there, even though I'm talking about Asia Pacific, what I'm talking about also relates to Latin America and to Africa. And when we talk about lower and middle income countries, we're talking about developing countries. I do not like the term LMIC. It, to me, it's derogatory. Whereas if you say developing, it's more hopeful, okay? So you'll hear me say that. The majority of the global health harms from tobacco happens in low and middle income countries. Now, focusing on Asia specifically, okay, of the 1.1 billion smokers globally, 664 million of them live in Asia Pacific, okay? So that is, it works out to approximately 60% of people, mainly smokers, and I don't mean to just not include oral tobacco, unsafe oral tobacco in India, but 60% of smokers globally live in the Asia Pacific region. People have asked, why do we do regional advocacy? Why did you guys get together and set up to do this? 
There's a couple of reasons. Even though it's a vast region and it covers a lot of area and it covers many different languages, many different cultures, and many different religions, the similarities are stronger than the differences. Now, in Asia Pacific, we share challenges, the same as what they're dealing with as well, like I said, in, in Latin America and in Africa. Most of, the, most of the countries in the region, like I said, are in the developing world. And we share the same socioeconomic issues. We influence each other on policy. And when I say that, I'm thinking to myself about if something happens in Malaysia, it actually winds up happening in Indonesia and vice versa, OK? It's, it's I want to say codependent, but that's really not the right word. It's just it, we influence each other with what we do, OK? Um, most of the countries in Asia Pacific, not all of them, but they do have tobacco interest manufacturing, governments have interests in tobacco, and some, some countries also have interests in pharmaceutical. And this is part of the challenge of tobacco harm reduction. We're also, the, all, the, all of our countries are also targets for, um, what do we call it? Philanthropic colonialism, I can never say that right. Okay. These are all messed up, guys. There's something wrong. I'm just going to read from here. <laughs> it's me. Sorry, guys. Um, here we outlined the government interest <laughs> in tobacco growing and manufacturing, OK? With the exception of Oceania, Brunei, and Singapore, tobacco is grown in most Asia Pacific countries, OK? And the biggest tobacco company in the world is the China National Tobacco Company, followed by the India Tobacco Corporation. You can see the numbers there, 2.13 million metric tons, 804,500 5, metric tons annually. That's a lot of tobacco. Um, in saying that, as well, Latin America and Africa also have the same issues with tobacco production and government interests. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is foreign influence in the development of tobacco control policy. We've all dealt with it. We've all heard about what's gone on. Um, what you might not know is that this is part of a wider plan by these certain um, billionaire philanthropic people to influence policy against nicotine, OK? And what they do is they're taking advantage. It, it's like. It's actually predatory if you, if you really think about it because you have countries here that don't have a lot of money. They don't have the resources to develop their own policies. So when these people come in, and they know this, they come in and say, hey, we can help you with this. With a scripted policy, you can implement this and we will help you implement this. The problem with that, okay, is you're taking a policy that was devised in the developed world and bringing it into a developing world without any consideration for culture, economics, and what these people really need. Governments, for the most part, with the exception of the Philippines, which I'll get into in a minute, think it's mana from heaven, and they accept it. It serves their purposes as well, especially if they have tobacco interests. We all know that China, India, these countries have gotten awards from the WHO for the tobacco control policy, and it makes no sense. It's cognitive dissonance, because these people are actually manufacturing and distributing tobacco, and they benefit from it. So it, there's this whole miasma, okay, of just hypocrisy, okay? And nobody thinks about the people. Nobody considers what is best for the people. Now, Asia Pacific, I keep hitting into this thing. Asia Pacific, from a cultural standpoint, shares a collective mindset. Now, this is what separates a lot of the people in the developing world from the developed world. In the developed world, people operate from a very individual rights perspective, okay? Whereas in these developing countries, it's a collective mindset. Some would say tribal. I don't want to go there because it doesn't apply for everybody, but it does in some. And when you're dealing with the collective, people operate as to what is best for the group as opposed to the individual, okay? I remember, 
growing up in the United States in the previous millennium, that this was kind of common then too, okay? It changed in the 80s, I'll let Amanda get into that, but a collective mindset is we do what is best for the whole, not for the individual. So the, the individual is not king. This helps us, I'm blinded from the light by the way. Can we turn that light down? Please? Literally, i blinded by the light. <laughs> Sorry, we're gonna have to do it this way. Sharing, re because of the, it's a collective mindset and because of the lack of resources, one of the things about regional advocacy is that we can share what we have. If one country has research that we can use and share in another country, that's what we do. If one consumer organization has someone, for example, in the Philippines, we have a lot of lawyers. They understand law, okay? It may not be the law that's happening in New Zealand or the law that's happening in Malaysia, but we have someone who understands law. In Thailand, we have someone who understands healthcare, okay? In New Zealand, we have someone who understands research and scientific research and reading papers. Sharing resources. This is probably the number one benefit of regional advocacy. One of the first things that we decided that we needed to do was to get ourselves an expert advisory group. Now, these are tobacco harm reduction experts, scientists, researchers from within the region. Because it is much easier to have somebody who is in that region, who understands the context, who understands the culture, to go to someone in government and say, hey, listen, this is, what, this is the science. It also doesn't feed into colonialism. And a lot of these countries now don't want a foreigner coming in telling them what to do, not in that way. They'll take the money, of course, we're not going there, but <laughs> you know, they want their own research because there's many times people have come in and said, well, this isn't, this isn't, how does this relate to us? As if the physiology of a human being changes from one country to the next. It, it, it's happened. Um, so this way with the expert advisory group, we've got a local person who understands, who has local knowledge, local context, and can go in and talk to these people and they can't give you those kinds of excuses. Now, right now in Asia Pacific, unlike the rest of the world, and it's kind of odd because I never would have expected this to happen, we're in a paradigm shift. And what I mean by that is we're going from a place where there's bans and restrictions or no regulation to now countries are beginning to consider and actually implement regulation. If you'd asked me this two years ago, I would have been like, no, that's not gonna happen. And here we are, it is happening. Um, the way we did this, and we actually all sat down and talked about this, is how did we manage to do this? Well, A, networks. In a collective society, network is key. Not money, network. Who do you know? And how can you get to that person? So if my cousin knows the Minister of Health, I'm gonna go ask my cousin to give me an introduction to the Minister of Health, okay? By doing that and explaining, listen, this is what we wanna do, this is why we want to do it. But most importantly, this is how this will benefit you. We were able to do this. And I'm thinking of Malaysia. I, wish, I kind of wish Sam was here to explain it to you because it was a very long process, but we got there in the end, okay? So when we think of advocacy and we think of we want what we want, one of the things that we did and I don't know if other countries have done, or other regions have done this. One of the things that we did was, let's focus on how this will benefit them. You couldn't use the healthcare argument because there's no real socialized healthcare in the region, but you could use the argument of, hey, you know what? You could tax this pragmatically, and especially in light of COVID, okay? You guys have lost a lot of money economically. So if you tax it, you'll gain some money back. And I think that's how we managed to get it past the post in Malaysia, I would say probably 95%. So, the, benef <sighs> the benefits of regional advocacy. We share knowledge, resources, and information. Um, we support each other with submissions, testimonials, and um, commiseration. What I mean by that, if there's a submission in Thailand, CAFRA will submit something, ECST will submit something, AVCA will submit something, the Vapors will submit something. So we all hit them at once, okay, from the region, okay? Again, if I have science or, or a report comes out from, say, New Zealand, and it's benefit, it'll be beneficial for Malaysia or Thailand, I'll give it to ASA. I mean, the, the regulations for New Zealand, I wind up handing it to, like, I think every country, because here, here's your template. And they were able to take it, adjust it, 
and present it, okay? That is a resource that is pretty priceless, I think. And having people that you can talk to and having people who understand what's going on and accepting the fact that, you know, here, like for New Zealand, for example, I handed those regulations over to the Philippines. And I said, guys, this is what we did. This may not work for you. Do what you have to do with it. I don't own it, no, you know, creative, none of that. Just here is what we have. We have an example. And everybody adjusted it and amended it to their country. And I think Asa would probably say that that helped him get through to the ombudsman in Thailand because here it was done for them. You know how the, 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 the philanthropists go in there and try to create restrictive regulation with a script? We hit it the opposite way. We, have, we want regulation, here's a script. And we find that that works because we were playing their own game. Ah, I did it again. Okay. I do have a final point, and there's something that I think we need to acknowledge. Um, I don't know how many people are in here because I can't see a damn thing because of the lights, but um, regional advocacy is something that can make all of us better. Okay, um, it's not been easy for us to do this, but one of the things that we've noticed is that we've had people from Africa come to us and we've had the people from Latin America come to us and we help them, okay, because we know where they've been and we know where they're going. We're gonna try to help them get where they want to go, okay? Because of the collective mindset, I think this is something that needs to expand out globally. I think we all need to work together and kind of leave our egos at the door. I think a lot of times, and a lot of the problems that we all run into is because of the ego thing. Collectively, we don't deal with that. I mean, we've had a couple of issues, but you know, we all understand that we're all in this together and we carry each other along. And the nothing about us without us, that has to be all of us, okay? It can be done, it's, very, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but if you approach it with respect, if you approach it with understanding, and you give people the consideration they need to just be who they need to be, I think you can get it done. I really do think we can get it done. So I just wanna thank everybody. I kind of ran through that really fast because I'm really nervous and I'm blind. Um, thank you for joining us, and I guess, Amanda, you're up next. myself situated here. It is very bright up here. Thank you, Nancy. It's really wonderful to hear about all of the amazing progress you guys have been able to make in the Asia Pacific region. And I think that's very inspiring to those of us around the world, very much so. Uh, my name is Amanda Wheeler. I'm a working mom and a small business owner. I'm also a former smoker who could not break free of cigarettes even after surviving cancer at a young age and going through chemotherapy. Cancer was not enough to get me to quit smoking, but vaping was. That's why I'm very proud to lead on this issue and speak for our cause, especially if that helps shatter the stereotype that vapors are either oddball eccentrics or hypnotized teenagers. I'm also grateful to be here because this conference is exactly what open discourse and deliberation on public health science ought to be about. Ideas are presented and challenged. There's a wide variety of stakeholder voices. Policy proposals and ideas can be tested by the intellectual marketplace of public debate. I'm here to carry the voices of our many small business members in the United States and to support the countless consumers that rely on their help and guidance to quit smoking every day. But that spirit is not what is happening in the broader public conversation about vaping and tobacco harm reduction. Outside these halls, it is unaccountable, domineering institutions like the World Health Organization, the Food and Drug Administration, and Bloomberg philanthropies that dominate the discussion. We owe it to both consumers and to one another to speak out candidly about the suppression of public discourse that is taking place. By their every action and policy dictate, you can see a consensus among these powerful organizations to impose a prohibition regime on vaping and to shut down, intimidate, and criminalize anyone who dares to object. The WHO is on a global march to outlaw vaping, 
knowing it can strong arm developing countries that depend on its resources. Just days ago, after WHO officials descended on Mexico to cajole its government ministers, that country criminalized all vaping products. Bloomberg Philanthropies works hand in glove with the WHO and shovels them tens of millions in annual funding. Bloomberg's fingerprints and front groups are visible in the prohibition schemes being decreed in every corner of the globe, including, most recently, a partnership that his front groups touted with human rights monster Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines. As of just a few weeks ago, the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. now has gained a comprehensive stranglehold on all vaping products of every type of nicotine in the United States. The agency routinely lavishes funding on pseudoscience to hype theoretical harms from vaping while reflexively downplaying vaping as a smoking cessation method. They have denied millions of products from the market while Bloomberg's front groups brag openly about their close rapport with the most senior FDA officials. And notice, please, that these groups don't seek to persuade. Their aim is to dictate and enforce. Although they may show up occasionally at conferences to mouth platitudes and pretend to take part, the real proof is in how they ostracize and disregard the very people who are the most negatively impacted by their policies. I invite you to take a casual look at the social media feeds of these organizations where they make their pronouncements to consumers in the public. There you will see an endless scroll of ordinary voices pleading with them for dialogue on both the science and their individual experiences of how vaping is helping people every day to quit smoking. But there is zero engagement. These groups never reply. They don't even attempt to offer meaningful acknowledgement, forget about empathy or accountability. When he was asked about these public complaints in a recent interview, the new head of the FDA, Dr. Robert Califf, simply laughed. He declared, quote, I'm 70 years old. I'm relatively impervious to critique. After surviving a harrowing confirmation process, he chuckled, what are they going to do to me now? And while he was on a comedic role, Califf also added that he has a few quips about the public input, quote, the intensity of the heat emitted by what I call the Twitterati, people who like to comment on FDA decisions, is inversely proportional to the quality of the evidence. And like that, we are all dismissed. This is breathtaking arrogance from a public health official, and it ought to outrage every one of us. It reveals the actual undisguised attitude that our public health overlords have towards tobacco harm reduction. In their eyes, we are just the little people whose lives they can manipulate like tiny avatars in a video game, if they even think of us at all. My organization, the American Vapor Manufacturers Association, has written both Dr. Califf and his predecessors repeatedly, and we are routinely ignored. Dozens of the leading tobacco science thinkers have written Bloomberg asking for a private conversation about the latest re research, and they too have been utterly rejected. Many of these same thinkers signed an open letter to the CDC chief, Rochelle Walensky, urging her to set the record straight on the, that the Evoli outbreak was not caused by nicotine vaping. But unsurprisingly, she said nothing and did even less. When FDA was granted sweeping control over all the remaining nicotine vaping in March, it was done with no public hearings, zero debate, and inserted as a midnight rider into a completely unrelated spending bill. Here's the worst part. Agencies like the FDA and CDC know better. FDA has been forced to admit that a handful of nicotine vaping products are, in their jargon, appropriate for the protection of the public health, precisely because the science shows they are vastly safer than cigarettes. But the FDA has done nothing to promote that life-saving message. And if I say to one of my customers that vaping is a great way to quit smoking, that same agency says that I'm violating the law. The CDC itself investigated the Evoli outbreak and found that it had absolutely zero connection with nicotine vaping. And yet they sit idle while the vast majority of Americans remain deceived by the agency's own misinformation. The one safeguard we are supposed to have against unaccountable power is the news media. But they are not merely failing in their duty, they are sucking up to the very people they are supposed to be scrutinizing and pushing clickbait scare stories that have vilified the most successful smoking cessation method ever devised. 
and I'm looking at CBS News, the Associated Press, Politico, the New York Times, among many others. They refuse to hold FDA or the CDC's feet to the fire, even as the public is being egregiously deceived. More than 70% of Americans now wrongly and falsely believe that nicotine vaping is as or more dangerous than smoking, a figure that has gotten worse in each of the last five years. Where are the stories on the countless people using flavored vaping products to quit cigarettes and how the FDA is stripping those products away from them? Where is the coverage of how vape shops that are helping marginalized communities to break free of cigarettes only to have their businesses crushed by arbitrary regulations? Where is the investigative reporting on how the most rabid vaping opponents in Congress are major investors in tobacco stocks? There was a time when a story about a maniacal multi-billionaire hijacking public health policy with bribes and deceit would have been a bullseye target for the press corps. But now that kind of reporting is completely absent to the immense disgrace of journalism. So let's say it plainly. The activities that I am describing are corrupt, they are unethical, the prohibition policies that are being imposed on the public are actively causing immense harm. And that means that in the big picture, the period of prohibition arrogance we are in today will soon be remembered as one of the worst episodes of regulatory malpractice in modern history. And shame on us if we sit on our hands while this neo-prohibition scheme steamrolls the communities that are counting on us to lift their voices. I know that there are some here who have urged conciliation in this crucial public conversation, but that diplomacy re requires a good faith dialogue, a two-way street that respects the input and dissent from all stakeholders. However, we are way past that point now and it's plain to see that this prohibition is an absolutist posture. It thrives on hubris and moral certainty. It mocks critics and it demeans individuals in favor of the collective. But everyday consumers don't need a history lesson. They can see with their own eyes how the prohibition juggernaut is crushing their right to switch to nicotine vaping and take charge of their own health destinies. Consumer groups like our friends at CASA in the US have gathered tens of thousands of those consumer testimonials. A common theme in nearly all of them is a hardening anger that their voices and their very lives are treated as irrelevant. Not a day goes by in my vape shops when senior citizens, soldiers, veterans, moms and dads, customers from every walk of life don't voice their indignation about how their own choices about their own lives are being stolen from them. The scientific case for tobacco harm reduction has been amply made at this conference and is well known to all of us here. What's more, we are talking about a fundamental human right to make our own lifestyle and health care choices. That's why my advice to advocates and consumers is let's speak up louder. Let's join arms with others facing the same challenge. No one, not a pope or a king or the New York Times or some unelected bureaucrat has the right to control what I do with my own body. The only way those forces will succeed is with our obedience, and my answer to that is no. That is also why everyone here has the same moral duty to say once and for all that enough is enough. Thank you. Yeah, that was brilliant. Thank you very much for a truly inspiring presentation, Nancy, and a fascinating response, Amanda. Uh, now let us move on to our Q&A session. For our audience online, um, please put your questions in the Q&A box. I'll read them out for you. And um, for the questions and comments in the room, please just raise your hand and the mic will come to you. Yeah, let's start with questions from the room. Yes, I see a hand over here already. Michelle Minton from uh, the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Nancy, I wanted to ask you a question. Of, you know, your, a lot of your work involves advocates and advocacy within developing nations. And uh, uh, I was wondering if you can describe or talk about any of the challenges with, that you might have encountered in terms of technology, of helping these advocates on the ground, these groups connect with, just you know, the actual ability not to coordinate, for one, to have resources to engage in advocacy, but then just to have um, the ability to speak with or communicate with the people in the power structures where they live, the, people, the decision makers where they live. 
Okay. Um, hmm. In some of the countries, and I'm going to use Thailand as an example, uh, you know, it, it, it was very difficult, and I, I really don't want to speak to it too much because ASA is here. However, I will say that, again, in some countries, it's a network thing. If you know, if your cousin knows this person, and that's how you get to the top to talk to people. In other countries, it's a matter of the way you do it will enable you to be able to do it. And you know, in some, and in other countries, it's you have to do it through the back door. You know, we're not talking about democratic countries where they have an electoral system and they have an, an MP's office or, or a congressman's office that you can contact. A lot of it is done grassroots. A lot of it is people doing protests within reason. A lot of it is um, talking about it within reason. Um, you know, I'm here to say to them, listen, whatever you need, you tell me what you need because there's so many different ways of doing things and it has to be appropriate for the person in their country within the framework that they have. As far as technology is concerned, they've got better acute computer equipment than most people, let's be honest, okay? Um, internet can be an issue, um, but you know, graphics, computers, things like that. The people in Asia Pacific are probably the most creative people I have ever seen as far as graphics, as far as creating things, as far as you know, online webinars and things like that. They know how to communicate and they know how to do that well. But a lot of what they do, they have to do it more, I don't want to say occult, but I want to say it, it's more getting people together and then doing it differently than it's done in the West. And I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Right, let's go to the next question. Right, uh, all right, I see a hand over here, right? And another one there, so uh, we'll go from here, then we'll go there. It's not really a question, it's, it's kind of a, a thank you to, to Amanda for, for, for uh, let's see if that's working, okay. It, so it's John from the UK. Um, a thank you to uh, Amanda and to Nancy for, for speaking and, and sharing what you've got going on. I wanted to just speak to something that you raised about, you know, people blocking um, the, the truth, the, the, the real science. People may have noticed that there's a number of people that are missing from this event that we normally see, that we normally hear from. And the UK is regarded as being a good place for uh, tobacco harm reduction. The reason that most of them aren't here is they're having negative pressure applied to them by organizations within the UK. Um, just wanted to make people aware of that, that you know, actually we haven't won the fight in the UK, nowhere near. You know, something that, that I find very interesting is, you know, the countries that we all looked up to, that look at how f open they are and look at how free they are and look, you know, how pragmatic they are. It's almost like the pen, it's almost like everything's been turned upside down. And that plays to what you're saying, John. You know, I mean, we use references from the UK to get New Zealand going, you know, but yet, you, again, you look at New Zealand and then you compare it to Australia and then they're, they're worlds apart. They're just across an ocean from each other. This pressure that's coming down, okay, it's insidious and it's, it's, it's in every level of public health policy. And when, and I think Mottawa has covered this, is the McCarthyism session. When you have your scientific researchers and public health people and people who are really motivated and have integrity and they want to do the right thing by people and that is being held back by these people that want it done their way, we have failed and we are failing. And I mean, looking at the UK, it actually depresses me because how did this happen? When did this happen? And it just shows you the power that these people have. And that makes it very important for us to raise our voices, such as what Amanda said, uh, you know, what Amanda said, okay? They may not listen to us, but if enough of us are loud, uh, enough, there's enough of us and we are loud enough, they can't ignore us. Right, thank you very much. Um, we have a question from our online audience. Um, I'll come to you uh, later on, but um, 
Let's just quickly take one of the questions from the online audience, and uh, it's going to both of you. And uh, the question is coming from Paul, and he asked, what can the Australian advocates do better to have their voices listened to? Well, so Nan Nancy and I uh, had some conversations about our presentation here beforehand, and you know, as someone who advocates on behalf of small businesses in the West, um, I really wanted to understand where she was coming from and you know what the differences are throughout that region because the challenges uh, where Nancy is at and, and the strategies that are successful, while they may have some things in common, there, there are very significant uh, cultural and societal differences that we can't really ignore. And so, you know, I don't, I don't want to overstep on uh, Australian policy. I have never even been to Australia, uh, and I'm not quite sure what um, their government structure is, is like. I think uh, Fiona is probably the best person to to speak to that subject, really. Um, but y you know, I I can I can, I can say. Um, what has proven successful in the U.S. and, and if any, in, in the successes that we have had in certain areas. And, and if anybody from Australia can benefit from any of that information, if it, if it would apply there, I think that would be wonderful. Um, so um, I'll, t I'll talk about um, my, my state association in Colorado and the big fight that we had this year uh, with the attempt to ban flavors in the state, which has been going on for, for several years, both at uh, city level. I, we've had about 45 of these city fights throughout Colorado. Um, we've lost, I think, eight of them, which, you know, it's always very painful uh, to lose one of those because not only are people losing their businesses, um, the people who smoke in that town are losing their options. And so, uh, but, but we have been fortunate to win quite a few of those city fights. And then on, on the state level there, we were successful in defeating the flavor ban there. And that, that was a combination of things. One, um, Nancy brought up when she was talking about um, this taxation argument, which 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 is pro a problematic discussion, I understand, but you know, for better or worse, we fought the tax fight in, in Colorado and we lost, and so you know, for a number of years, we've had a very steep tax there, and, and it was helpful during the flavor ban because that money in Colorado is used to fund universal pre-K, which was one of the governor's key campaign promises, and so he's loath to um, have that revenue um, lost and endanger one of his um, central programs that he promised to the people. Um, but uh, beyond, you know, sort of a cynical money argument, um, one thing that we've always done there is we've built um, a very big and very large and vocal coalition of um, mostly small business owners, but, you know, most of all us small business owners uh, are, are consumers and, and we own our businesses because we're passionate from our personal experience. Um, so we have a, a very large coalition of, of all types of small business owners, women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, businesses that are owned by immigrants that came to America to pursue their dreams and have succeeded, um, and, and, and consumer voices as well. Um, and we're also very fortunate, and a number of, of policy experts are in the room here that, that assist us and come speak out in those fights. Um, so between having um, PhD public health experts, um, policy and think tank experts that, that you know really do great in-depth research on the consequences of these things, consumers, small businesses, we're, we're able to um, put up a pretty strong defense. In Colorado, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids built up this 100 organization coalition that had um, something in the range of 200 lobbyists representing them. Uh, the newspaper there said it was the one of the most heavily lobbied bills in state history, and everybody was assuming all of those lobbyist numbers would be coming from the big tobacco side. Right, but but in reality, if you look at everybody that was opposed to that flavor ban and the number of lobbyists that they all had collectively on it, we were outnumbered about three to one with Bloomberg-funded lobbyists. Um, and, and so I think the, the you know the way that we really held our own is by getting everybody that had a common interest in this together and, and, and to put their kind of petty beefs and differences aside and focus on what was really central, which was preserving harm reduction and, and flavors in that state. And I agree with everything that Amanda just said. And I think, because I do have some knowledge of what's going on in Australia, 
I think what has to happen is everyone has to try to get along. The vendors need to understand that without the consumers, they don't have a business. The co consumers need to understand that without the vendors, they have no access. And the, Australia is a very strange situation because as of last October, they're a medicalized system. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, let's move on to the next question. I think we had a, a hand over there, then we'll come to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Amanda. They were both really informative and really uh, great, great presentations. I had a question, I think it's probably more directed at Amanda, but Nancy, you might, might also be able to help. Has there been any research into the work of, that vaping shops do? Because vaping, the shop, the stores themselves play an intrinsic role in rolling out this harm reduction. And it, it just struck me that we don't seem to talk about that enough, the, the importance of the, the conversations that you have with your customers, um, the, the, the link, the way that vaping stores quite often link, link consumers to bring consumers together so that they can advocate. And I, I was wondering if there had been any research on vaping stores in general on the work that they do, or if there's any plans underway to do that. You know, t t there, there may be, you know, a few isolated things that aren't coming to mind at the moment, but as, as far as I'm aware, um, our segment of, of the marketplace and, and of harm reduction activity is, is very rarely looked at, right? And, and there are a lot of reasons for that. You know, on the um, anti uh, side, um, you know, it's not in their interest to acknowledge that anything other than big tobacco exists in this space, right? Um, and on our side, um, you know, um, w we haven't been fighting these big flashy political fights for decades. You know, we're sort of learning the things that we need to be doing and, and the, the kinds of um, data that we need to be collecting and what we need to be uh, putting out there because, you know, we're, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been a long fight, it's gonna continue to be a long fight, and I think we're evolving and, and learning new things all of the time. Um, one thing that I would recommend uh, to anybody who hasn't seen it was during the recent e-cigarette summit in the United States, um, a wonderful vape shop owner by the name of Mark Sliss um, gave one of the, the best talks I've ever heard in, in all of harm reduction advocacy, and it was exactly um, his firsthand experience of, of what occurs in his vape shop and just how special that is. Um, and it was so moving to me. I mean, it just really stands out as one of the best talks I've ever seen. Um, and so, you know, I think um, I, I was so happy to see his voice elevated at that event and, and, and for him to have the platform to tell that story. And so, you know, my hope would, would be that, that more of those types of stories continue to be told because you will be hard pressed to, to find someone more uh, passionate than a small business owner who works with his consumers, his customers face to face. You know, small business owners, when we see our customers pull up in the parking lot, when we see their car, we're pulling product off the shelf for them because we know what they want. We know their spouse's name. We know their children's name. We know what they do for a living, you know. Um, and, and not only that, but when people, you know, want to start looking into vaping for the first time, uh, it's, there's, it's an overwhelming experience, and it's very easy to have that first experience with vaping be with the wrong product. And, and, and people will walk away and say, well, I tried vaping and it didn't work for me. And it just turns out with a little more tailored help, um, they would have had a lot more success. And, and that's really what's special about uh, the vape shops is that that is that, ex that place of expertise and knowledge. And it's, it's, it's not factored in. Uh, and the, the FDA places no value on it. Um, as I mentioned in my response, you know, it's, it's um, a, you know, almost a criminal act for us to, you know, say certain things to our customers. And so we have to be very careful about how we advise and guide people. And I think it is something that should be looked into because vape shops should be able to tell their customers the truth. Yeah. I mean, we did that in New Zealand, okay? Before the new regulations came in, we were doing tracking of the people that came in and we were getting their stories and we were getting their information. And then the vendors at that time, the one that comes to mind is Mike Brader. He became a resource to the Ministry of Health so that they could see 
the effectiveness of what they were doing. I mean, like Amanda said, the majority of the vape shop owners, are pretty much all of them, okay, they're former vapors and the reason, former smokers, and the reason they got into this is to help people. And that's one of the issues with Australia, and I know it's not your fault, Fiona, but that's one of the big issues with Australia is people helping other people. If you medicalize them, you turn them into patients, they're not gonna want that. And that's a lot of what you know, the problem is in Australia, going back to what Paul was saying. And that's how a lot of these people actually wind up moving from being people who smoke to being people who vape, is people helping people, everyday consumers. In, it's hard to track in some countries because again, as you know, it's illegal, okay? And the problem with that, of course, is because it's illegal, it's black market and it makes it even harder to trace. But I can tell you in a very unofficial way, that's how it happens. It's not through any kind of official means. It's through the vape shop owners because they understand, because they've been there and done that. All right, thank you very much. We have another question from our online audience, then we'll come back to the room. Uh, the question is coming from Sarah. She says, thanks for this session. To the whole panel, here's the question. What do you see as the biggest challenges for tobacco harm reduction consumer advocacy? I think burnout. <laughs> you know, you're constantly fighting with people. You're constantly, you know, you, it, sometimes it feels like you're going one step forward and two steps back. That's one of the big issues. The other issue is the isolation. You know, it, it, there's a lot of people out there that are fighting for this and don't have support. They're sitting, you know, in a back bedroom somewhere or, it, we have to all come together. We have to be a community. I mean, when I first started this, I was, it was three of us in New Zealand, and we didn't even know that like GFN existed. We didn't even know NNA UK existed. We only found out about this because Mottawa was kind enough to take us kind of under our wing and say, oh, you guys, you know, um, the biggest threat right now is burnout. I would say absolutely. I would I would agree with that, Nancy. And you know, I, a couple things come to mind. Number one, I think um, stigma is a huge challenge. You know, obviously, our consumer advocates that are here at, at this event um, aren't necessarily deterred by that, right? But for your average person, there's so much misinformation going around. You know, people. Um, I remember um, not so many years ago when people were very proud. Uh, about their their stop smoking journey and and the fact that they vape and and it, and it was something that was a badge of honor and I, I don't know when this happened I think maybe it was during 2019 during the whole Evali disaster um, it almost became something that people were like wanted to hide right that that they couldn't be as as vocal on or as out there about anymore because there was so much judgment going on especially in the United States around that time. Um, so just a lot of stigma. And number two, um, the process is hard to engage in. And that's why, um, you know, as, as small business associations, it's hard for us because we're always underfunded, but, but I, I really feel for some of the consumer groups because I imagine that problem is even worse in consumer advocacy. Um, because especially with our political system in America, if you don't have a significant amount of money to throw at it, good luck engaging and getting anyone to take the time of day to deal with you. Um, so I, I would say those two things, and probably lots of others. All right, thank you very much. And I would also like to share my thoughts. Being someone who is coming from Africa, Malawi, a developing country, one of uh, the challenges that we face is um, what, according to Nancy said, like uh, we sit at the uh, exporting end of, uh, let's say, policies, same as uh, misinformation, just like Amanda has just highlighted. So like um, in Africa, we, or in developing countries, we sit at the uh, exporting end of misinformation. And when the media comes with a such kind of misinformation, it is usually coded with uh, fear-mongering frames and it attracts um, uh, public attention. So it's very difficult to um, correct such kind of misinformation, uh, to clear such kind of misinformation after they have already been flooded by the media. So that's one of the challenges that we face. And on top of that, um, accessibility of safer nicotine products. 
like um, we, we don't really have uh, locally feasible and uh, socially uh, or culturally acceptable safer nicotine products. So uh, like, uh, like in Malawi, the only safer nicotine product that I know is uh, electronic cigarettes. But these are very expensive for an average income earning smoker in Malawi. So as advocates in Malawi, we kind of find it difficult to uh, uh, just advocate for one a safer nicotine product which uh, other people in the country cannot really access. So it's a little bit tricky to advocate for something that does not necessarily exit, exist in the country. We can't really talk too much about snus where snus is not available. We can't really talk about uh, nicotine pouches, too much about nicotine pouches because by the end of the day, people will ask where are these products would like to see them. So that's one of the challenges. Um, now let us move Jim, on. Jim, I want to say something. Right. I don't even know if this thing's on. Hello? Okay. One of the things that's, that's, that's a big difference here is in America, you have, previous to what's going on now, you guys had access and choice. Yep. In the developing world, we don't have that. And that's kind of what, what Chim was saying. And we, in the developing world, we're sitting here fighting for people to have what you guys had. And it's then like what John was saying, it's very disheartening to us to see you losing and the UK losing. And we have to sit here and wonder, it's like, well, where are we going? It's, it, it, and that's what causes, at, that's one of the, hard, I think that's the hardest thing for being a, a tobacco harm reduction advocate, especially in a developing world. Because we see other people that have had it, we want it, we can't get it, and then the people that we're looking up to, they're losing it. Yeah. And that's where the burnout comes from. Thank you very much, Nancy. Now let us move on to uh, the next question in the room. We had a hand over here. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, H from Factasia. Uh, uh, just before, before I launch into whatever I launch into, let me just say, Amanda, that was phenomenal. Uh, had I not seen you do it before, I'd be on the floor flat out. That was brilliant. Nancy, I love you, girl. Brilliant. Uh, Jim, uh, I want to hear more from you. Um, my, my question, which obviously has a lead in, um, with, with the, uh, what, what you were discussing about the struggle that you faced in the US, which sounded to me like there was some litigation involved, um, which is normal, I guess, for the US, but also very expensive. Um, Nancy, I, I happen to know that uh, litigation is just simply not an option for you. Um, uh, Jim, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm assuming that litigation is equally uh, impossible. Um, but I have also have to know that CAFRA is completely unfunded and has no funds at all, so couldn't involve, and that would be the same thing for all the associations, including ours, that are, that are underneath it. So litigation going to court uh, to, to try to address this thing, even though it, it might have some, some, some logic to it, is not appropriately, uh, it can't be done because uh, there's no money. And, and Amanda, you pointed out that litigation is, is something that you, know, you kind of have to follow from time to time and you don't always win. Um, but equally in Malawi as a tobacco producing country, um, we know that Bloomberg has been funneling billions into undermining everything that we need uh, and, and want uh, and the smokers desperately need access to. We know that there are very powerful individuals in the country throughout the region that, the, that, that I live in that have some significantly corrupt vested interests in tobacco production, in importation, sales, what have you, uh, even in countries where products are completely illegal but available widely uh, through the black market. Somebody's making a lot of money out of that. Do any of you feel threatened by the vested interest of powers that be in your countries? Um, how do you cope, sorry, there's a couple of questions here. How do you cope with being unable to go to the courts to fight your battles? And is funding an important, necessary, or irrelevant component in consumer advocacy? 
loaded question. It is a loaded question. Um, funding would help. It's like anything else. You know, money doesn't make, you know, money isn't everything, but boy, it sure helps, right? Um, I can't talk about the litigation, as you know, because there, if the, even if there was a mechanism, half the countries, it's banned, and you know, you could go to jail just being caught, so I can't talk to that. Um, I think I'm gonna hand this one over to Chim. <laughs> well, that's crucifying me, and... Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I should be honest here. I think I wouldn't really be able to give a good answer to your question at the moment, but I'm, I'm happy to discuss after, afterwards. Thank you. Right. Yeah, and on, on that note, so it's interesting. So, um, you know, FDA went through and denied, you know, 98, 99% of all of the applications um, that were put in by the small businesses. Um, and, um, you know, as an association, um, in the U.S., you have to have something called standing in order to uh, redress your grievances in court. Uh, and, and um, you know, our association, uh, you know, doesn't have standing, right? And so it's really unfortunate because all of these um, very small businesses have to take on that litigation on their own. And, um, you know, and it's a huge gamble because you never know how that's going to go. And, and, and that's a, it's a major financial commitment. And I, I talk very closely with a lot of the companies that have under, undertaken that effort. And I mean, mostly they're just pissed. And so they're, they're going for it. And I think they're very grateful to have that avenue available for them because unfortunately, you know, we've tried to win on the facts. Um, you know, we've, we've tried to pr be persuasive in the court of public opinion. Uh, we've, we've gone to our lawmakers who are supposed to defend our rights and, and all of those things failed. And so now many of them are, are making their last stand in the court system. And, you know, I, I support them, but Lord knows how it's going to go. We, you know, any lawsuits that have ever come from our small business sector in the past haven't had, you know, a ton of success, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe, um, some of these will be different. And there, there has been some very early, uh, you know, positive outcomes in many of those cases. So hopefully they go well. But yeah, that's, um, I think that's the one, the one last possibility that we have to possibly be treated fairly. Right, thank you so much. Uh, in the room, is there anyone who has got some comments to, I mean, on what has just been asked or discussed? Is that a comment? A question. All right. Um, I actually just want to respond to Fiona and her question about research and vendors. Um, putting my researcher hat on for a moment, through uh, the Centre of Research Ex Excellence in Indigenous Sovereignty and Smoking, we've actually got a pilot um, program training program running at the moment called Squirrel. Now I've had to get it out because it's not spelt like squirrel. So it's dub 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 dot squirrel s q u i r a l dot net. Now the first thing we did was actually we surveyed vendors in New Zealand to find out what their knowledge about nicotine and addiction and all that sort of stuff was. So we used that as the basis for the program. It's primarily designed for people with no training whatsoever or knowledge. Um, but part of what we do in that is we're gathering baseline information so that when people enrol in the program, whether they're vendors or tobacconists or however they're delivering, um, we get all the baseline information about their um, attitudes and beliefs. And the process uses gamification, so we're not lecturing them about, yeah, you know, it's not the normal process. And um, so we're going to track them and see how, how they um, develop their skills and whether that actually affects their ability to be more effective in helping smokers to stop smoking. Thanks, Chaga. Thank you for your contribution. All right, uh, we move on to our next question, coming from online, to the panel. What can be done to energize certain states in the US to get back to advocacy? 
All right, uh, what can be done to energize certain states in the United States to get back to advocacy? What can be done to get certain states to get back to advocacy? Energizing advocates. Oh my gosh, I, I wish I knew the answer to this. I spend a large amount of time trying to, you know, cheerlead and, and you know keep people motivated because it's it's hard i mean there 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 are days when you know i want to go crawl in a hole and never come out again you know it's i i i don't quite know i think right now um you know people are looking at what's going on with the food and drug administration and all of the product denials all the things that have been taken away how it's being um, you know, either, you know, driven away entirely or driven onto the gray or black market. And um, I think people um, are taking a minute to grieve right now. And, and I hope that, you know, when that minute is passed, uh, people will kind of be re-energized because we can't stop fighting. You know, if, if Nancy can has, have these kinds of victories in the Asia Pacific region where pl things were totally banned and come back from that, you know, certainly we can make progress even with this dark point that we're in right now. So I, I, I hope, I think, um, you know, I think our advocates need to really come together and support each other. Um, just like on the panel of, of scientists the other, the, yesterday, in that area, you know, I think our advocates can come together. Yeah, I mean, it's like the seven stages of grief. You get sad, you're in denial, and then all of a sudden you get angry, and that's when things happen. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> right, thank you very much. Next question in the room. Right, we have a hand at the back there. Thank you, Sam Hampshire from Botec in the States. Um, Amanda, this, this is for you. We, we both live in states where uh, consumer and other stakeholders have moved the policy needle with direct democracy, so referenda, plebiscites, um, ballot initiatives, and I'm talking about cannabis legalization. Uh, what is the opportunity and perhaps the threat for uh, direct uh, kind of consumer advocacy at the ballot? Well, uh, this is a long discussion about how ballot initiatives work in the United States. This is probably going to get way too much in the weeds, but it is so expensive. You have to, to get something on the ballot, in, and I can only speak to the, this may not be the same in all 50 states, but in the states I'm familiar with, there are two ways to get to the ballot. You have to pass a referred measure through the state legislature, or you have to do it through signature collection. And there are a lot of rules and specifics surrounding what's, how many signatures have to be collected, where they have to come from, the criteria those signatures have to meet. Uh, you have to collect extra over and above the target because a large portion of them will always be thrown out. Um, it's, it's very time intensive to collect them. It's, it's very expensive to collect them. There's a, you have to, it, it's a whole very complicated, very difficult thing. Um, it, it, it can be done, but I don't think that that um, is something that uh, would be very easy for a consumer organization or a small business organization to take on without some kind of support just because of how complicated that is. Like what, what you're talking about in, in um, Arizona with the cannabis legalization that went to the, through the ballot uh, measure, um, that was done with the, the financial backing of the entire um, medical cannabis industry in that state that then, um, and, and it was problematic because they, they wrote the laws so that only the medical people could have the recreational licenses. So it was this very monopolistic thing because they were the ones that were spending all the money on the ballot initiative. And so it's one of those things that it's, it's just so expensive. It's almost like it's an avenue reserved for big businesses or if you have Bloomberg funding, which, you know, sadly, that is not the position most of us find ourselves in. Right, thank you very much. Uh, Nancy, would you like to maybe add anything on that? Yeah, on what, I mean, all right. Right, thank you. Um, any other questions in the room? Right, we have a question over here. One last question, and I promise I'll leave you guys alone. Uh, for all three of you, I would love to know, thinking about the research community, and that includes both academics and think tankers like myself, um, you know, people who just write policy, uh, what, or who, who write about policy. I wish we wrote policy, we do not. Um, what can we do? What would you like to see more of from academics, from the research community to help support you? Or alternatively, what 
would you like to see that community, the research community, stop doing or back away from if there's anything that you, you from your position as advocates on the ground, uh, if there's anything researchers, you know, pro-tobacco harm reduction or harm reduction researchers are doing that's hampering your efforts or what we can do to help further? Would you like to tackle that? What kind of research might be helpful? Yeah, it is a hard one, but let me just try to attempt it. And um, yeah, maybe I should start by the academia in general, not not just uh, tobacco harm reduction specific um, researchers. I, I, I am aware that uh, there are certain journals that don't really accept uh, anything related to, uh, I mean, anything to do with tobacco harm reduction. So, like, uh, to the academia in general, journal owners and everyone, I think I would really have loved to see if they can be able to accept um, any paper that is tobacco harm reduction related, not just because um, it's tobacco harm reduction, then they push it away and stuff like that. I think there, I, I have a number of colleagues, I personally know people who, whose papers have been rejected just because it is a tobacco harm reduction paper. So I really would have loved to see uh, the academia in general, the researchers, the journal owners accepting each and every paper. Secondly, um, when it comes to the tobacco harm reduction researchers, I feel like uh, there are certain regions, countries, where you barely find information on tobacco harm reduction. For example, in Malawi, one of my colleagues was doing um, a literature review on snus. Mm -hmm. You'll find nothing, zero, uh, zero something on, uh, on that. Another one was doing, a, uh, uh, I mean, was writing a paper on um, media framing of tobacco harm reduction in Africa and um, in Malawi. There were no papers on that. So I think uh, this is something that maybe researchers can look into and uh, maybe uh, try to diversify their research areas and um, countries in which they can uh, do their research. Because like for policymakers to uh, make informed policies, they need such kind of uh, well-written papers peer reviewed and uh, well published. So yeah, that's what I can say. Uh, what I can say from my research background, Michelle, is a lot of times um, when we're talking about academia, okay, and we're talking about research, you need to publish your parish, and I'm sure you're aware of this, okay? And a lot of times when you go to apply, you wanna do a project, you have to go to somebody above you and get approval. Now, if tobacco harm reduction is, is contentious, which it is, okay, um, a lot of times, you're not gonna get funding. You're not gonna get funding from NIH unless they have a specific you know, program towards tobacco harm reduction. You're not gonna, obviously, the American Lung Association, American Heart Association, they don't wanna hear about it, okay? So it, it's hard to say what can the researchers themselves do because their hands are tied, really. Because the, the, the funding is gonna come from outside external sources who do not want to actually acknowledge what tobacco harm reduction is. So I would say, ultimately, you know, creating um, consortiums, and I believe there is an, a, a magazine where they can publish their studies, but it's not, quote unquote, um, uh, peer reviewed, but it is. But you know, it, it won't never be a first class um, journal or peer reviewed, you know, acceptable thing. It depends on the editor of the journal. It depends if you're in academia, if your higher ups are gonna allow you to do it. Most of that money would probably come from private foundations to, to be able to do that, and most private foundations, I hate to say it, are very much anti. So their hands are tied. Thank you, Amanda. Would you like to add? Uh, you know, Michelle, all, all I'll add to that is, is just really a thank you, because you know, our um, think tank researchers in the United States are some of our very best resources, 
and allies, and that's people like you and, and people like Lindsay uh, and, and many others. I'm not trying to play favorites. I just see you two right up front, and you all are incredible. But um, you know, I, I know that that you guys are always right there with the data and the facts, and you know, ready to talk through consequences of bad policy and you know, weigh things, you know, pros and cons of different things. And you know, same same for the scientific and academic. Um, Researchers, I know that you know. I, I I wish there were more of them, but I'm very grateful for the courage of the people that do um, the work in this area, d despite you know career consequences and funding challenges and all of that. All right. Thank you very much. I think we have got room for one more question or two. Uh, any other questions? Right. Uh, I have a question for you too. Right. Um, so my question is, how crucial do you think it is for advocates to work with a unified, uh, I mean, in a unified manner, getting everyone on board, women, men, everyone should be on board, and avoid stepping on each other's toes? Um, I think we all have to work together towards a common goal, and I think, the approaches, I mean, I see differences in approaches between developed countries and developing countries. That comes down to a lot of cultural considerations, like I mentioned earlier. Um, there are women in THR. There are a whole bunch of them. But the thing is, again, going back to culture, there are a bunch of women working in India. There are women working in Latin America, OK? But you don't see them. And if you don't see them, don't just presume that they don't exist, because they do. Um, they're not loud and proud. They're the people behind the scenes doing the things at Chugger, right? For example, okay, she's, she's a vapor, um, she's an advocate, and yes, she's also a researcher. She's not any less valid than I am. Actually, I'd say she's probably more valid than I am, okay? But we do work together, and I think there is this idea that because you only see the guys and you only see the cloud bros, right? <laughs> you know, where are the women? Well, we're here. And we do work together. I mean, I know we do. I, would you say the same in America? Yeah. Um, female advocates are wonderful because they, they, we all work together very nicely. Our organization is um, largely female run. We, we have one uh, male board member. And, and, you know, we didn't construct it that way intentionally. It's just kind of like, you know, it, those are, there were those of us that, that were just naturally were able to, to kind of check the egos and work towards solutions. But I, you know, to answer your question, I, I think, you know, we all have to work together. You know, the, the, the anti-harm reduction contingent is so organized and, and so coordinated and so on the same page. They have this mega force that they've assembled. And, you know, in order to even come close to being able to counteract that, we're, we're going to have to all work together. And everybody has different strengths, and that's another thing, too, is focusing on everybody utilizing their strength together. Right. Thank you very much. I think that was brilliant. Um, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to extend our warmest thanks to Nancy and Amanda. I think I enjoyed this session, and I hope you also all enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you, Chair.